it said there's a consensus, uh, and, and it, we should take seriously the fact that there's so many climate scientists uh, and people related to them, you know, are saying this. I mean, so this is something that uh, merits serious uh, attention. So I'll say that first. And so that, uh, when, when these people make these kinds of uh, predictions, or I should say this, the Intergovernmental inter, uh, inter governmental Panel on I, I, PC, is that an inter, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is founded about uh, 1988, I guess it was. Uh, the United Nations. Yeah, the United Nations. Yeah. Uh, they're the ones who publish these reports. They publish four reports now and so on. Uh, they're quite, it's interesting when you read some of the documents, they're, they're pretty cautious about what they say. Uh, they don't make predictions because the people writing the document, documents are serious enough as scientists to know they can't predict. They can't predict about this uh, because they don't know enough yet. So, so they, they, they put forth what they consider to be likely scenarios, what might happen if all these other things happen, but no one knows really what, what's going to happen. So there, there, was, there was a consensus developed among uh, a significant body of climate scientists. However, and, and how shall I say, put this, uh, I guess I just assumed this, they were right. So, because they're the scientists. And so for a few, you know, some years I, I went along. And then I started last year, uh, I, you know, I, I said, well, you know, I had, to, I had to learn something about this, you know, instead of just whatever I read in a newspaper. So, or see on TV or something. So I started doing my research. And then I discovered, well, my gosh, you know, it's not, it's not so cut and dry here, first of all. They're pretty eminent climatologists, Richard Lindsay at MIT, and uh, this guy Willie Soon at uh, Harvard, uh, 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 and a bunch of other people who, who, are, who said, look, it's not, carbon dioxide is not driving this thing. Yeah, we've been warming up, but that's not why it's happening. And I said, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Why are, and so then I started reading more and more. And I, I pretty much concluded that, look, after reading in this stuff for about a year, that the, the issue's still up in the air. Uh, there's a consensus on the pe part of the people who think this is true, but there are a lot of people who don't think this is a, this hypothesis about human carbon dioxide production. Uh, they don't believe that that's really what's driving the change in climate. <clears throat> now. It, now, in the meantime, we've had a terrible uh, situation of the complete politicalization of science. It's a very bad situation. You have a lot of, of uh, working scientists, not people who are retired, but people who are working scientists who've mingled the politics with their, that is the domain of value and policy making, which is always value oriented, with their science and not always making it clear that they're speaking with a political agenda on the, where, while wearing the hat as a scientist at the same time, which they should not be doing. Scientists should be involved politically, but they should make clear when they're making political statements and when they're making scientific statements. And people on scientists on both sides of this issue have, have blurred this distinction. I think it's a major mistake, uh, integral theory, emphasizing the importance of differentiating different domains so what's going on is a, is a bl blurring of the lower left, if you will, with lower right, uh, with, with uh, fact and the lower right value in the lower left. Uh, and so we get pronouncements uh, to this effect. Science says this, and therefore we ought to do, to do such and such. Uh, no, uh, science is not in a position uh, to uh, indicate what we're supposed to do. That's up to us to make th those decisions, what we ought to do based upon a whole lot of other factors independent of what science says. Science is able to generate, uh, generate hypotheses which it tests, and if the hypotheses uh, tested prove, turn out to be valid, then this goes into the scientific canon as a uh, demonstrated, uh, to a large extent demonstrated uh, truth that has a lot of su evidential support. But that's very different from making policy recommendations. And policy recommendations are when Politicians, policymakers, and we, the public, have to make decisions on how to spend our money and what we ought to be investing in. 
And these are things that science can't tell us. Now, in a way, politicians would prefer that scientists tell them what to do, and then they can say, well, look, this is what the scientists told me. I'm just doing what they said. But this is a cop-out. This is a confusion of domains. Now, our own Roger Pilkey, Jr., up here at CU Boulder, uh, whom I know and is a member with me of the Environmental Studies faculty, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Honest Broker. And in the book, he said, scientists, their best role is to, is to help policymakers by uh, giving them uh, several alternative options. You could do this, you could do, in other words, the, the evidence, this, what we know as scientists, uh, the, uh, says this and this, and, and here are some things you might want to look at. Uh, so what uh, the honest broker as a scientist is someone who helps the policymakers sort out what they ought to do in the policy domain and providing them with uh, facts, evidence as much as they can to let them make the decision without secretly pushing an agenda, this is where they become the dishonest broker, pushing a political agenda while wearing the scientist's hat. And this has happened. And it's a very risky proposition for science. 